Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. This episode we're gonna cover a session I played on Thursday, which was a couple of days ago now, which as you guys saw from the intro was a meetup game hosted by none other than Johnny Vibes. I'm sure you guys are familiar with this guy. He's another poker vlogger. If you don't know who he is somehow, make sure to check out his channel because he has some pretty awesome stuff on there. But yeah, he had a meetup game in San Diego, actually Hamul, which is just a few miles east of San Diego. Actually a little more than just a few miles, but we'll get into that in just one second. Anyway, the game was 2-5 no limit. One cool thing about this place is they allow you to buy in for a thousand instead of 500, like a lot of Los Angeles $5 bait blind games. So a little bit deeper than you would otherwise see here in LA. But anyway, I wanted to do something a little bit old school for this channel, which is do a room review for Hamul. I've been here two or three times now, so I have a pretty good feel of the room, and I figured I'd share with you guys some of my thoughts so you know what to expect. As always, remember, these are just my personal opinions. I encourage you guys to always try these rooms out and see for yourselves. But without any further ado, let's get into some of the pros and cons for this specific poker room. Number one cool thing you'll notice upon arrival is their materials. They have really nice tables, chairs, the felt, the chips, everything is top notch and it's honestly a much more enjoyable experience playing with nice stuff than like old broken down dirty stuff as you guys know. Secondly, the floor staff, super cool. They're really, really nice and not only that, but they're flexible. They let us do pretty much anything we wanted. So we wanted to run random double board bomb pots, no problem. We wanted to do splash pots, that's fine as well. Anything that the players want, they usually accommodate as long as it's obviously nothing crazy. So that's pretty cool because in some other poker rooms, it's kind of the opposite. They're super strict and anything that isn't within their guidelines, they just won't even allow you to try and experiment with. So Hamul gets a thumbs up for that one. Another great perk about this poker room is they have a ton of promotions. On the day that we were there, they were giving out flat screen TVs and cash. Like, I think every half hour or every other hour. I'm honestly not even sure what the structure was, but every few minutes you'd hear the loudspeaker go and they'd announce a winner for either a television or a hundred bucks. I actually got one of the hundred bucks and my friend got a TV, as you'll see right here. All you gotta do is be playing there. You collect some tickets. They put them in a giant drum, spin them, pull out a ticket. You got yourself a TV. And one last thing, which isn't exactly poker related, right around the corner from the poker room is an awesome upstairs bar with a great view over the valley, if that's what you would call that area. They got great beer selection, some free games to play, and I think they have food options as well. It's one of the nicest uh, casino bars that I've seen in a while. So if you play a session here, do yourself a favor, head right around the corner, up the escalator to, uh, I'm not sure what it's called actually, I'll put it right here. But yeah, make sure to uh, check that place out. Obviously, no poker room is without some downsides. Number one for this place is gonna be, it's not really their fault, but it's just far away from everything. There's nothing really around Hamul, California. In fact, I'm pretty sure it's an Indian reservation. So if you're looking for somewhere quick and local to play, this is not gonna be on that list. Unfortunately, it's about a 30 minute drive out from the heart of San Diego, I believe, which is why obviously there's a lot more business at their uh, local competition, Seven Mile Casino. Moving on, as a result of it being really far away, they don't have a lot of games. Um, on the weekends, I think they get 2-5 going, and I think maybe once a week they get 2-5, but aside from that, it's mostly 1-3, no limit, and normally just one or two tables, possibly, but yeah, if you're looking for a lot of options, they also can't really offer that, just based on, you know, not a lot of people coming through the door. Lastly, the room isn't that big. Obviously, all three of these uh, cons are kind of tied together, but it is what it is. It's not really a big room. I think tops, they have eight or nine tables, and I doubt they fill up, uh, except for maybe special days, but for the most part, half the room is full. And yeah, it's just not really like a commerce casino or Bellagio experience where there's a ton of poker action everywhere you look. Overall, I personally really like this room. It's more my cup of tea. It's small, it's low key, it's not filled with a bunch of pros and uh, this like really aggressive competitive atmosphere. It's very laid back and it's very sociable. So if that's something that you prefer as well, you'll definitely like this room. I recommend you check it out if you're ever in the area. And lastly, my personal score would be a seven out of 10. Also shout out to this poker room for letting Johnny host his meetup game here. And on top of that, letting us film liberally. They gave us no restrictions with the cameras. So as you guys will see in a second, we got to do as much B-roll as we wanted, which is pretty cool. Cause normally, you know, you gotta be a little incognito in some other poker rooms, but that's about it, I think. So uh, let's get into some poker hands, yeah?
All right, hand number one is actually responsible for the title of this video, as well as probably the biggest pot I played all night. We decided to do a double board bomb pot, which in case you guys aren't familiar with those, just means that there's two flops, two turns, and two rivers, and you could win either the bottom or the top board, or you can win both if you somehow manage to have the winning hand on both of the boards or make everyone else fold their hand. Oh, and there's no pre-flop play. It all starts after the flop. In this hand, we get dealt seven, six of diamonds. Everyone throws 20 bucks in the middle. Luckily, we're on the button, which is obviously a great place to be in a bomb pot. The first board comes out pretty nice. It's ace, six, six with two hearts. So we flop trips. The bottom board is nine, five, five with two clubs. So obviously we have uh, not a lot going on except for an inside straight draw on that board. Small blind checks and Johnny leads out for 75 bucks. Right away there's some alarm bells going off in my head because I know he's a smart thinking player and I know he understands that leading into a field who hasn't even acted yet in a bomb pot where we could have absolutely anything is a pretty strong play. So if he's playing the board that we're playing, which is the top board, we can't really be in amazing shape. Sure, he can have some worse sixes, but aside from that, I don't expect him to lead out with anything worse. To make things slightly more stressful, middle position now jams his short stack of $305. Action folds to me, and at this point, I have around 1.5K, and Johnny has 1.3K behind, so still a lot of money left behind. I decided to make the call with the intention of folding, I think, if Johnny went back over the top. I'm not sure I wanna commit my entire stack without even being sure if we have, you know, at least one of the boards locked up in this case. So I make the call and Johnny thinks for a bit and also makes the call, which brings the pot total to a little over a thousand bucks. Turn cards for both of the boards are actually pretty great. The top one is the king of clubs and the bottom one is the three of diamonds. So on the top board, if Johnny did have a six with a better kicker, we're not chopping with a bunch of them, obviously not a king. And on the bottom board, we pick up more equity with a two-way straight draw. Johnny checks it to me and although he could be trapping with the absolute nuts on at least one of the boards, I think the best play is to move all in and try to force him off his hand if we are chopping the top board or maybe even fold a five on the bottom board thinking that I could have a better five or pocket nines. If I'm somehow chopping the board with a middle position player it's obviously a huge win if Johnny folds the winner on the bottom board so those are my thoughts as I decide to move all in covering Johnny and putting him in what I think is a tough decision because we don't get snap called <laughs> And eventually he does say, I hope you're playing the top board because I'm playing the bottom one. So at this point I know I'm chopping with him if he decides to make the call. Eventually he does make the call and shows 5-3 offsuit and the middle position player shows 8-6 offsuit. Looks like I'll be chopping half the pot with this middle position player and Johnny will get half of the main pot all to himself since he's playing the bottom board alone. River cards come inconsequential and we end up getting what's called quartered, which is actually my first time being a part of that. It means we get a quarter of the pot, the all-in player gets a quarter of the pot and Johnny gets half the pot. Pretty exciting though to play an over $3,000 pot with Johnny Vibes himself. And the cool part was that it took so long that people started to gather around the table and watch. So pretty fun hand to play nonetheless. In the second hand, everyone limps in and I look down at ace king of clubs from the big blind. The game was playing pretty loose so I decided to make it $45 to go and still managed to get three callers. Yeah, and you thought $45 was a ridiculous size, right? Nope. Anyway, four ways to a flop comes down king, six, deuce, rainbow. Obviously a great flop for us. I decide to bet $75 and the player on my direct left who was the under the gun limper raises it up to $225. Everyone else folds. At this point he only has around $250 behind. It's a little weird because I don't expect him to have any bluffs on this board. There's really no semi draws. So if he doesn't have a bluff here and he's raising for value, there's really not a lot of hands that we beat that he should be raising for value. But then I remember that it's live poker and people sometimes raise top pair, I guess to see where they're at or something, but with only 250 behind, there's really not much of a decision here. He shouldn't be folding any hands at this point, just based on the fact that he committed half his stack already. So I decided to move in for 250 and surprisingly he thinks for a really long time and ends up folding.
So I'm not really sure what hands he could have to commit half his stack and then end up folding with two cards to come, but seems like a win to me. I'll take it. Third hand we'll go over here is yet another double board bomb pot. This time we're in the big blind and we look down at ace queen of diamonds and I'll let you guys see these flops for yourselves. Right when it looked like it was gonna be another boring bomb pot, we flopped the absolute nuts on the second board. Obviously this one doesn't have as much thought process as the first bomb pot versus Johnny. It's gonna be pretty straightforward. Small blind checks, I decided to bet $75. The cutoff raises to 200 bucks, leaving himself with 250 behind. When the action folds to me, I decide to move all in here and try to capitalize on any fold equity that there might be, though I suspect it's probably almost zero, considering that people don't really bluff raise and bomb pots, and on top of that, the top board is paired, and I don't expect him to fold a 10, since that's one of the only few hands he could really have here. And sure enough, he makes the call when the action gets back to him. He shows queen 10 off suit, the run out for the first board comes five king and the run out for the bottom board comes 10 nine. So we end up chopping it up. In the next hand, there's three limpers and the button decides to raise it up to $20. I'm on his direct left in the small blind looking down at ace king off suit. It's slightly concerning because the button had been fairly tight, but also with this exact sizing, $20 over three limpers, I don't expect him to have aces or kings. So can't really ever be in terrible shape. And obviously flatting would be pretty terrible because it gives everyone behind a good price to come in. So I raise it up to $80 and only the button makes the call. We're fairly deep at this point. I think he has around a thousand and I cover him. So keeping that in mind, as we go to a flop of 864 with two diamonds, I check it and he checks it back. Turn is the seven of spades. I could go either way here between a bet and a check. The reason I like betting slightly more is because I think he would bet his over pairs when check two on the flop. So in case he has the same hand, we could get him off that and just pick up the entire pot ourselves. So I put out a bet of 125 and he makes the call. River comes a five of hearts, so all the flushes miss and there's a straight on the board. I think there's hardly any nines at all in his range here, especially considering that he checked back the flop. If he did have a hand like pocket nines, I expect him to bet there pretty much every time just to deny equity from over cards. So even though we don't really have any nines in our range either, I think he definitely doesn't. So I decided to move all in for his entire stack, hopefully get him to fold whatever he has. I think from his perspective, it can't be that easy of a call because you're either calling to chop or lose. So it doesn't seem like a great result either way, but eventually he uh, thinks for a while and makes the call and we chop it up against pocket queens. So he had us in pretty terrible shape there. The check back on the flop was pretty sneaky, but uh, I don't think we were putting in another penny on most river cards. So uh, this one works out okay. Another chop pot and I think I like my river shove. In the next hand, I come back from a quick break. The dealer asks if I wanna buy the button or wait until it comes around. I say, why not post the blinds and get dealt pocket aces. That's a nice warm welcome back. There's three limpers. I decide to make it $30 when the action gets back to me. And we see a call from the under the gun and middle position players. So three ways to a flop, which comes down 10, nine, seven with two hearts. Not really a great board for uh, pocket aces, especially considering that my opponent's limp called. I think this is a good spot to throw aces into a check from out of position. So that's what I do. The under the gun player bets $40, middle position folds, and I have a pretty easy continue here, which I do. Turn comes the queen of hearts. Again, not really a great card. So I decide to check it again. This time he checks it back. River comes the five of clubs, which shouldn't really change much. I think I missed a bet here because I expect most hands that are better than aces to bet the turn for value. So once he checks it back, that kind of gives us the green light to bet ourselves on the river, assuming the river is a clean one, like the five of clubs. For some reason, I decided to check. I believe my thinking was there's a lot of missed draws and he was a pretty aggressive player. So there might be more value in letting him bluff. He ends up checking back. So at that point I can assume that he has a one pair type hand. Obviously we have the best pair. So I just roll it over 
and we get shown seven six offsuit. Not really sure if he would have called a value bet there on the river, but I still think I should have bet and try to get some value from a 10 or whatever. Anyway, on to the next hand. It's time for a dealer change, and you know what that means, another bomb pot. This one's gonna be pretty easy. We get dealt pocket fives on the button. First flop comes ace, king, nine, and the second flop comes six, seven, three. Obviously we flop pretty much nothing, but when the action checks all the way to me on the button, I kind of realized that there's not really any hands that are super strong on both boards. Meaning both of these boards are so different that if you have a strong hand on one, you can't really have a strong hand on the other, except for obviously like top set and hands like that. But I expect all of those hands to bet the flop. There's really no point slow playing in bomb pots. So I decided to take a stab here with 180 bucks of dead money out there. I figure no one can really continue unless they have really, really strong hands. And as I said, I don't think anyone has really strong hands given that it checked all the way to me. So I put out a bet of 105. Yep, bluffing into eight people. Somehow, some way, it gets through. Everyone folds. It makes me look like a genius, but obviously I'd look like a complete idiot if someone called me down and I have to show down fourth or fifth pair. But uh, this time it works out and I'm not sure how much uh, credit I can give to my thinking there on the flop. To be honest, it might be a bunch of bullshit. I don't really know. But that's the fun thing about double board bomb pots is no one really knows how to play them. Last hand, we'll go over here. Action folds to me on the button. I look down at King Jack off suit, figure it's good enough for a raise, so I make it $15 to go. No need to go too big here considering that there's only the blinds to get through, but both of the blinds call. So 45 bucks in the middle and we go to a flop three ways of 886 rainbow. Action checks to me, this is such a dry board that my opponents are gonna miss a bunch. So I think we could get away with a cheap bluff here. I make it one third pot, 15 bucks. Small blind makes the call and the big blind folds. Turns the jack of clubs, we pick up top pair with a pretty good kicker. He checks it to me and I decide to get really deceptive with the intention of betting really big on most river cards to make it look like a bluff and hopefully induce a hero call from some smaller pairs or maybe even ace high. Turns the deuce of diamonds, he checks it to me again and I think that's one of the most perfect rivers to bet huge on. It's gonna look like I'm trying to steal the pot. So I make it 100 bucks. He calls pretty quickly, I show the king jack and we're good. It's funny, afterwards he actually told me that if I'd bet smaller, he actually would have folded, but the big bet made it look really bluffy. So I'm glad that the plan worked out that time. Anyway, after that hand, I played a little bit longer, but uh, shortly after decided to rack up and call it a session. So that's a wrap for Hamul. Played for around five hours and booked a win of a little under a thousand bucks, I think. You'll see it right here. But uh, yeah, obviously that's a great success. But even more so is the fact that I got to meet a bunch of you guys who watch these videos. Everyone who showed up, thanks for making the drive. Thanks for getting together with us and playing some cards. Had a great time. What's next from here? Uh, I got a few ideas coming up. I suggest you uh, hit that subscribe button because there's some cool vlogs coming up. Don't wanna spoil anything just yet because it's kind of in the works, but uh Thank you for watching. Thanks for the support. Thank you for liking this video if you did. Thanks to Johnny for hosting the game. Thanks for the staff for letting us do uh, some stupid, ridiculous double boards. And uh, yeah. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. I'll see you all next time. Peace.